Well, Helena, um, you published a newsletter on globalities this past week about Gaza, um, kind of in the in the same vein of what what you were just talking about, centered around how people outside Gaza are admitting to feeling hopeless to affect any change there, or rather feeling pity uh, for the 2.3 million people. And you say that, quote, hopelessness, hopelessness and despair cannot be an option, especially for those of us who are outside Gaza. And I'm increasingly of the view that pity is a patronizing, othering, and somewhat self-paralyzing kind of response to the situation Gaza's people are facing under Israel's truly outrageous genocidal assault. Uh, let's have you talk about what you mean here and how you tie it into historic situations of um, other massive relentless sieges and assaults. You, you bring up Leningrad, for example, and, and what we can learn from that, why that's relevant. Yeah, you know, I had the, uh, the experience of growing up in the United Kingdom in the era of decolonization there. And I think that has really helped me to understand a lot of what's been going on um, in this country around especially Gaza, but earlier, you know, the war in Vietnam and so on. Uh, so in England, when I was growing up, there was this like just almost blanket demonization of everybody who was fighting for national liberation, whether it was in Malaya or in Kenya or anywhere else in the British Empire. I mean, I grew up with the idea that the Mau Mau, who was a Kenyan national liberation, main Kenyan national liberation movement, they were, you know, akin to, to devils. You know, they, they had all these terrible rituals that they went through and they would kill white people and whatever. And of course, you know, when the British Empire finally like decided that they couldn't actually hang on to Kenya, who did they negotiate with? You know, it was it was essentially the Mau Mau and, and the same in Malaya. So, you know, here we've seen it so often that, you know, people in in the global south who who are, you know, the enemies of the United States are demonized, dehumanized. You know, we, we are we in the white world are taught to fear them and hate them. And um so, so I, I feel, Helena, sorry, I, mean, I feel it's not working the same way anymore. I feel it's not working. I mean, no group has been more demonized by Ham than Hamas. And we're not just talking about since October 7th, we're talking about for 30 years, no group has been more demonized in the West than Hamas. And I find that people aren't buying it the same way they used to. I, I, wa I wonder what you think. I, I totally agree, and I think there are a lot of good reasons for that. I would say that back in the day, you may remember, and I certainly remember, that the PLO was equally demonized, you know, until Abu Mezin came forward with the idea that, you know, if you just surrender, essentially, then then the Israeli and U.S. Um, empire builders will, will give you a good deal. And we know where that led Abu Mezin. Um, but, you know, back in the day, the PLO was definitely demonized to the same extent. Um, so you're right, Ali. Um, this time it isn't working and it isn't working, I think, for a number of reasons. One is that the white empire, you know, people of West European heritage only constitute about 11 or 12 percent of global, global humankind which coincidentally is the same proportion that white people occupied in the in the population of South Africa back in the days of apartheid. So um, I think over recent years, and this is something I've been looking at quite a lot, the ability of the white empire to keep control of the whole of geopolitics has eroded for many, many different reasons. And so there are a lot of other voices out there that, especially in English, um, maybe also in Chinese, definitely in Arabic, um, it, within all these different spheres of, of um, discourse that are not, you know, totally controlled by the BBC or not totally controlled but by, by VOA or, you know, the white narrators. So, I mean, I think obviously... Um, Al Jazeera has played a huge role in the Anglosphere, 
Um, but a lot of other media have too, including electronic intifada, voices that are, you know, smart, engaged, very well informed, um, very w articulate. <laughs> what was it? They, you know, that comment that Joe Biden or somebody made about Obama once, you know, that he's remarkably articulate, you know, for a person of color. <laughs> but it does, it does actually, you know, it makes a difference to be able to communicate effectively in English with a with with citizens of the empire, if you like. Another thing is that this country here um, in the United States has a lot more um, people of Arab and Muslim heritage than it did 20 or 50 years ago. And, you know, before it was, it was relatively rare to find, you know, an Arab American who occupied a professorship at a major university or who was, you know, working in major media. Now there are a lot of, a lot of Arab Americans in those positions and, and that's great. So I think it's a combination of things. It's a kind of a diminution of the United States um, global power to control the narrative and it's the um, eruption or or the emergence within the US and and global English language discourse of people who are who, who are not of you know who are not of uh, the empire <laughs> Helena you mentioned just on this theme of the empire and you you mentioned this briefly the the hold of geopolitics when you look at I mean, you've been looking, and we've talked about this before, the global shifts, the rise of China, the fact that China brokered the historic uh, reconciliation between Iran and Saudi Arabia, Russia gaining strength, the, the defeat of NATO and the war in Ukraine. Those are sort of long-term trends that we've seen picking up steam in recent uh, years, over the past two years. I'm wondering how you look at that now, and specifically in the context of this genocide in Gaza and the regional developments around it. How do you see that geopolitical picture changing or consolidating? I know that's a big question, but take it any way you want to. Yeah, thanks for asking, Ali. I've just finished writing like a 6,000 word word essay on this topic, um, and I've been thinking about it very deeply. You're absolutely right to to pinpoint the impact of um, the Saudi Iranian reconciliation that was unveiled by the Chinese um, China's top diplomat Wang Yi back on March 10th of last year, and I think it it had a huge impact in setting the stage for what we see now, um, because for many years prior the white empire had very systematically played divide and rule between Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims right across West Asia. And that had devastating effects. For example, you know, um, the Hamas military, when they actually, um, early in the days of Hamas, when it was still developing sort of guerrilla slash military tactics, 1994, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin um, expelled, I think 400 Palestinian community leaders from, from the West Bank and Gaza, the Israeli occupied territories. A large proportion of those were Hamas people. Um, they, he tried to expel them to Lebanon. Lebanon wouldn't admit them. So they ended up in a no man's land in South Lebanon, where the only people, the main people to, to help them were Hezbollah, which was already developing extremely effective military guerrilla tactics against the Israeli troops that were occupying a um, huge chunk of South Lebanon. So from the very beginning, or rather from 1994, Hezbollah and, and Hamas exchanged ideas. Actually, I would say that in the early years, Hamas took a lot of ex ideas from Hezbollah as to how to organize an underground slash guerrilla military um, set, of, set of operations. And, and they were very close. So when the, the uh, 
Arab Spring, the so-called Arab Spring, the much belated whatever Arab Spring, broke out in 2011, very speedily the opposition movement in Syria became supported by Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and you know, majority overwhelmingly Sunni Muslim powers who actually subverted the opposition movement and turned it into a kind of a Sunni Muslim fundamentalist movement battling against the, um, the sort of Shiite adjacent nature of the Assad family. Now, it, it, I've, I've studied Syria a lot. Syria has I mean, the Syrian government has a lot of support from the Muslim community, but if, from the Sunni Muslim community. But um, the Assad family themselves come from this minority sect, which is Shiite adjacent. So the, the, the white empire, and of course, let's not forget that the CIA was also in there in Syria in those years, funneling weapons, you know, to the opposition in an attempt to, to hogtie the... Uh, the Assad government. And the whole thing was extremely sectarian. And that sectarianism, even to some extent, infected the, the Palestinian rights movement. And so it definitely it did, yeah. Yeah, so it continued for many years. You know, that uh, Shiites were perceived and, and described in, in Sunni Muslim um, countries as, as be, you know, being akin to the devil, all this demonization that goes on. But it, so, it even it even preceded that, Helena, because I think it also that was ratcheted up following the 2006 war in Lebanon after Hezbollah defeated Israel. Right, and was right. Being that feted, stunning defeat. Yeah. Yes, and was being feted all over the Arab world as heroes, resistance heroes, Arab national resistance heroes against Israel. So there was this concerted campaign in Saudi-owned media pushed also by Israel and its lobby, people like uh, Martin Indyk and what's the other one, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Oh, Martin Kramer, I mean, all of them. The, well, well, yeah, but uh, they, and they started pushing this narrative really hard that Iran is the enemy of the Arabs, Iran is the enemy of the Sunni Muslims, and the so-called moderate Arabs, which meant client regimes of the United States, the Saudis, the Gulf states, Jordan, etc., that their real interests lay with making an alliance with Israel against Iran. And that was it not the ba was the basis of the US divide and rule strategy that is now pretty much in tatters. Yeah, you're you're quite right to date it to back to prior to 2011. I mean, I remember in, in 2006 when when Hezbollah was so stunningly successful in in you know, completely humiliating the IDF in Lebanon within 33 days. Um, they had, like, shown them off. Um, I sat in the uh, the sitting room of a Palestinian-Armenian friend of mine in uh, Jerusalem, and he was just glued to Hezbollah television, Al Manar. <laughs> you know, that's all he wanted to watch was Al Manar every afternoon at 4 p.m., and, and that was the kind of solidarity, the anti-Zionist solidarity that this divide and rule um, sought to undermine. And they were very successful. Long story short, over like recent years, I want to say maybe the past three years or so, the governments of Oman and Iraq both started saying, we've got to end this rift between Riyadh and Tehran. We've got to like try to rationalize and ensure that our region doesn't get consumed by this, this Shiite-Sunni divide. So they started mediating, mediating, mediating. And, you know, it's not easy to mediate, you know, a, a very deeply held set of uh, antagonisms. The Chinese then came in, I want to say probably toward the end of 2022, and they nailed the deal. So, you know, the the, the uh, big photo op that happened on March 10th of 2023 was when you had high level negotiators from both those countries coming together. And, you know, the handshake, I called it the handshake that, that uh, shook the world. It's, it's, that's not even a thing, whatever. Um, and 
it, it wasn't just a one minute, you know, photo opportunity. It had real consequences. The then, you know, the Saudi foreign minister went to Syria and visited with, with President Assad. Syria was readmitted to the Arab League. Interestingly, the only Arab state that voted against that was Qatar. Um, but, you know, Qatar does its own thing, whatever. It's sometimes useful and sometimes uh, somewhat less than useful. But my point is that that reconciliation between Hamas and Hezbollah really was an important part of the backdrop for both what happened on October 7th, the, the, the breakout operation of October 7th, and what has happened since. So, you know, definitely set, set the stage for that. Well, Helena, you know, I mean, I, I, this, I feel like we're just getting warmed up, but unfortunately we only have a couple more minutes. So the one thing I'm going to say is that we have to have you back soon to discuss some of these. But I, I'd love, love to get your parting thoughts on, well, two things. One is what... You know, we've talked about the very big picture here, and those are things that are very important to keep an eye on. I, I'd like to get your thoughts of what you see happening sort of in the in the immediate future, specifically in terms of regional resistance. In other words, what's happening in the Red Sea, what's happening in Iraq with the attacks on American bases, uh, of course, what's happening in the border in Lebanon. I mean, that's a, a long, a lot to talk about in a couple of minutes. But also how this plays out in the United States, or any any sense of morality, ethics, decency, common sense, reasonableness, humanity. I don't know. I could go on listing. Would suggest that Joe Biden or whoever is handling him should pick up the phone to Israel and say, stop this now, stop this yesterday. Is that going to happen? <sighs> Oof, yeah. Ali, you asked the really easy questions here, right? <laughs> so just quickly, I know you, you want me to move off, but there is there are six sub-theaters that essentially ring the Arabian Peninsula from Gaza to Lebanon to Syria to Iraq to the Houthis to the Red Sea itself. I, was that six? I hope. But in any of these sub theaters, could you could actually see the spark that sets off a region wide conflagration? You know how how um, unthinking it is of of the the all those people in West Asia to have their countries so close to the US Fifth Fleet. I mean, really, you know, why can't they just move elsewhere and let the Fifth Fleet take over? So, you know, it, it really could happen. And I'm scared of this at any moment because until now you've had very good signaling in a sense um, across the Lebanon border. You've had a lot of exchanges of this and that. And Hezbollah has done some really interesting things, I have to say, against the Israeli Air Force um, radars in northern Israel. But, but that's never escalated. It could. So the whole thing could take off. What this will mean, I mean, in terms of uh, President Biden doing anything rational, I do not know. What I do know is that in 56, when I was but a young thing, actually, I was four years old, you know, Anthony Eden, who was extremely sick and you could say incapacitated by sickness, his rational powers had been completely degraded, launched a, a, a horrible attack against Egypt with the aim of overthrowing um, President Nasser, along with the Israelis and the French. And on that occasion, President Eisenhower stepped in and said, this is crazy. This is, you know, this is immoral. This is bad for the region. It's bad for the world. It's bad for humanity. And he threatened to pull the plug on the pound sterling. And immediately Anthony Eden like saw the light and actually he resigned and the British and French and Israelis all withdrew from occupied Egypt. 
is there a power in the world today that is capable of stepping in and using economic leverage against Joe Biden's depraved aggressiveness in against Gaza and against the Houthis? Possibly, possibly the, the global majority can do that through economic leverage, but it's not easy. Um, and they thus far, they have not done it. But you know, if we have that region-wide conflagration that I talked about earlier, then basically the whole global system is going to have to get involved. Yeah. And, you know, this thing about friends don't let friends drive drunk. You know, friends shouldn't let friends spark a, a global war, especially when Israel and the United States both have nuclear weapons mm. there in the region. It's it's a terrifying prospect. But anyway, I know you want me to move on, and I'll be happy to work with you more, Ali, both on our um, Gaza Rights Back project. I know what my problem is trying to see the, the camera. Is <laughs> it's it, mirrored. It's not a mirror here. <laughs> oh, heck, now I've figured it out just when I'm that door. The other thing I want to say is please, everybody who's watching this, do tune in to the palcast oh there it is at that side okay that is our new podcast that yusuf al jamal from gaza now sitting in istanbul and i and our friend tony groves in in dublin we've just finished our 20th episode we're doing two episodes per week and we we're trying to build as i mentioned earlier this kind of globe circling network of people in the anglosphere from all the different countries of the world who support Gaza. That's Great. wonderful. And and Yusuf, of course, has been a guest many times, and we hope to have him back. He's a wonderful writer and a great friend. And um, thank you for all you're doing, Helena. And we don't want you to move on at all. We have a very <laughs> packed show today, though, and we want to have you back as soon as possible. I feel like we were really just getting started. Yeah. We need to do this yeah, more Yeah, lots more to talk about. And thank you guys for what you do. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.